you have your Bibles or your phones or your iPads or tablets, yes, it's good to see so many uh, friends and family and some of you we haven't seen in a while. First Kings chapter 11 is going to be our canvas for the word of the Lord today. First Kings chapter 11, starting at verse 1. Hallelujah. If you have that, indicate by saying I have it. If you don't, say wait. Okay, we'll wait. Amen. You can follow along. The Bible reads, King Solomon loved many foreign women in addition to Pharaoh's daughter. Moabite, Ammonite, Edomite, Sidonian, and Hittite women from the nations that the Lord had told Israel about. Do not intermarry with them, and they must not intermarry with you. Because they will turn you away from me to their gods. Solomon was deeply attached to these women and loved them. He had 700 wives who were princes. Yes. Just ponder that for just a moment. Those of you that have one wife. I'm telling you. One wife is all the woman I can handle. My mind can't comprehend. See, y'all, see, because y'all only think about the sexual side of marriage. But I'm trying to tell you, that alone. Some of y'all, some of them wouldn't see me for... <laughs> I'm tired. Lord, I'm tired. My God. My God. But the emotional demands, the mental demands, the time demands of a marriage. Could you imagine 700? Huh. Can you imagine the infighting? Women don't share. And if they do, they don't know they're sharing. 700 wives who were princesses and 300. He didn't stop. They, Solomon was busy. 300 concubines. And they turned his heart away from the Lord. When Solomon was old, his wives seduced him to follow other gods. It's important who you marry. Mm. Because there's a power that a wife has over her husband that no other woman should have. Hmm. He was not completely devoted to Yahweh his God as his father David had been. Solomon followed Asheroth, the goddess of the Sidonians, and Milcom, the detestable idol of the Ammonites. Solomon did what was evil in the Lord's sight. And unlike his father David, he did not completely follow Yahweh. So far the reading of the scriptures. Well, if you've got a flyer, 
you know that my assignment today is entitled Soul Detox. Everybody say that with me. Soul Detox. Now, I know you think this is a message just for the singles, but trust me, it's not. Bow your heads. Father, we come to you in the matchless name of Jesus. We thank you, God, for each and every person that you've pricked and pulled upon their hearts and impressed upon them the importance of being in this service today. We don't believe that anybody that is here is here by accident or here because there's nothing that you have in your word for them to receive today. We ask you, Holy Ghost, that you would come into this place like a flood, that you would fill every empty space and every crevice, that you would sit on this house, God, until our hearts and our minds are set ablaze by your word, until, God, the fertile to the heart, the heart and of hardness of our hearts is fertilized, God, by your word, that the seed of your word would be planted, Father God, deep down into our hearts. Most of all, Father God, I ask you that you would expose every trick, every scheme, every diabolical plan of the enemy, that you would expose his doings and his workings and the ways, God, that he tries to keep us enslaved and in bondage, Father God, in many cases to people and the circumstances, God, that we aren't even in anymore. And God, we give you praise for this. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen and amen. amen. We were created with a soul. Uh, we understand that man is, in essence, three parts. We are a spirit. We possess a soul, and we inhabit a body. When God formed Adam in the dust, the Bible says that he breathed into Adam the breath of lives. He became a living soul. In other words, Adam was given the capacity uh, to reason, to feel, to understand and to experience the world around him. The soul is the thing, uh, the place, the seat uh, where our mind and our will and our emotions ha are housed. Having a soul, we are designed for interaction. It is a lie for people who say they don't like people. That's a lie. That is simply a defense mechanism that has been established because people have been hurt. We were created for interaction. For the Bible says that God looked at Adam and said, it is not good for man to be alone, for him to be all one. So he reached into Adam's side, he pulled out a rib, and he created woman. And he presented the woman before the man. And the man saw that it was good. Amen? We were created not only for interaction, but we were created with the need to bond with people outside of ourselves. It is in the fiber and in the fabric of the soul of human beings to need connection. Whether that connection come in the form of friendship, whether that connection come in the form of romantic relationship, whether that connection come in the form of family relationship, connection is a part of our DNA. It is a part of who we are. Nobody wants to be alone. I don't care what they tell you. I may not want to deal with you, 
specifically, but I don't want to be by myself the rest of my life. We weren't created to do that. We were created for one another. Look at somebody and say, I was created, I was created. to be with people. The first look in scripture at this context, of course, is marriage. In Genesis 2 and 24, uh, the Bible says that a man will leave his mother and his father and cleave to his wife, and the two will become one flesh. Now, I want to look at two words in that passage. The first word is cleave. The word cleave means to cling or adhere. Um, it almost means like uh, a tape. It sticks to whatever you put it on. The man was called to be so connected with his wife that he was stuck to her. We're stuck together in marriage. The Bible goes on to say that they would become one flesh. For those of you that were here for the teaching that we did on Jesus the same yesterday, today, and forever, you'll remember this word for one. It is the word ekad which means united. So the man leaves his, his bond with his mother and his father, and he creates a new bond with his wife. And the two do not simply bond from living together. They don't simply bond by having candlelit dinners. They don't simply bond by in-depth conversations, which you need all of that too. But one flesh deals with the intimate act that brings a man and a woman together and eternally fuses them on a deeper level than what the physical act itself represents. Flesh there is the word bazaar. It's B-A-A-S-A-A-R. Or pudina. P-U-D-E. I had to look that up. I was like, pudina? <laughs> what does that mean? But pudina is the word when we're talking about flesh that actually is talking about the sexual organs. So, uh, you see what I'm saying? <laughs> so when a husband and a wife come together, they don't just come together in contract, but they come together in flesh, creating that covenant. Their sexual organs come together, creating that covenant, further making them one. Now, what we have to understand about our subject today is that the Bible does not specifically use the term soul tie. Neither does it use the term rapture uh, and some other terms that we use that are really more theological terms that are designed to describe an event or a theme in the scriptures. But the concept of souls being tied together is biblical. In the Bible, it may use terms like their souls were knit together. It's the same thing. If we understand the soul being the mind, the will, or the emotions, then we understand that the soul plays an integral part in your ability to be bound to other people. 
In other words, if, uh, if someone is in love with somebody, love is produced in the, uh, in the mental and emotional realm, correct? So part of my connection to you is soulish. Y'all don't hear what I'm saying? That I connect with you not simply on a intellectual level or simply because we are in uh, physical proximity, but for closeness to be established, the bond has to be deeper than that. You with me? All right. Now, though the term soul tie is not in the Bible, the concept is there. So let's, let's, let's talk about that for just a moment. A soul tie binds two together on a mental and emotional level, causing an external gravitational pull or bond. Have you ever been away from the person you loved and there was just like a little ache? Come on. Some of y'all act like y'all looking at me like y'all ain't never, well, y'all ain't never had no tie with nobody. Come on now. Loose, loose, loose in here. Loosen up in here. It's going to be painless for you in a minute. But that pull and that longing to talk to them, that pull and that longing to hear their voice, that longing to touch their hand. Y'all don't hear what I'm saying. Huh. That is a bond and a tie that is created in the soulish realm. That thing, uh, what's the secular song? Uh, you got me thinking about you day and night. That's the soul. Yeah. Overseer Kevin knows what I'm talking about. <laughs> That's the soulish realm. Without the soul, it would be impossible to connect to other people in any kind of meaningful way. You with me? So it's a bond that's on an emotional, a mental level. From a scriptural standpoint, we see two kinds of soul ties or soul entanglements. We see a godly soul tie. And we see an ungodly or an unhealthy soul tie. Examples of godly soul ties would be with God. How many of you know that God asked for your soul? He said, love the Lord with your heart, your soul, come on, everything that's within you, your strength. So God says, I want your soul to be tied to me. Not just your mind, not just your church attendance. Come on, come on. I want you to long for me. I want you to desire my presence and desire my word. That's in the souls, in the soulish realm. Here's another godly soul tie. Fellowship with Christians. For the Bible says that we should be joined, fitly joined. And knit together with one another. Do y'all hear what I'm saying? That's in Ephesians 4 and 16. It tells us we need to be fitly joined. We're a body. In other words, there should be a bond in the house of God. Oh, you don't get to love God and hate me. You don't get to call yourself a Christian, yet I don't like the people I worship with. Oh, God, oh, God. There's a level of compassion that you're supposed to have for your brothers and sisters in Christ that you can't have except there be a bond. Come on, 
Except you be knit to them, come on, yeah. by the Spirit of God, yeah. for the love of God is shed abroad in our hearts by the Holy Ghost. Yeah. 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 Hmm. You can't even do the work of God effectively if you don't have a bond for the people you fellowship with. See, a lot of times people want to go to big churches because they don't want no bond. They don't want an accountability. They don't want nobody in their business. I don't want to know them people. I want a word and I'm going home. But that is a mindset and a mentality that is contrary to the word of God. And either we believe God's word and we're going to live it. Or are you wasting your time? I'm not going to come here to do what I'm going to do. I'm going to do what I'm going to do. Why live in a bind, honey? Why live in a crib? If you're going to do you, do you at home. Come in here and got to let somebody preach on your stuff. And <laughs> We also see family. That's a godly soul tie. You're supposed to have a bond with your family. Mother with children. Father with children. Children with the parents. Children with the aunts and the uncles. That's what's wrong with the society today. The Bible, not the Bible, but they say it takes a, a village to raise. But we don't even like our family. <laughs> Family reunions are almost a thing of the past. All right. All right. When the older generation dies off, people they quit having them because right. the young people never develop the bond. All right. yes. Yes. But that's a godly thing to have love and connectivity for your family. My God. I just want to parenthetically insert here, get it right with your family, please. Yes. Y'all don't hear what I'm saying. I don't know what's going on. I don't know what you fell out over. But get it right with your family. Funerals should not be the place of bonding. Come on. Because that's the only time we come together is when somebody dies. But we can't pick up the phone and call one another and check on one another any other time. Me. You didn't call me. Don't come crying in my funeral. All right. All right. Hallelujah. That's, That's, That's a godly bond. Here's another bond. Godly bond. Friendship. Friendship is a godly thing. The Bible says that greater love have no man than this, than a man laid down his life for his Wow. That's pretty serious. Because what we say is blood is thicker than water. That's why we can't love our brothers and sisters in Christ. Because blood is thicker than water. Well, blood is the only reason we're here. The blood of Jesus is what unites us and what binds us. Come on, somebody. But friendship is so important. It's a miserable life to not have friends. Come on. It's a lonely life. Let me tell you something. If you can be married and still be incomplete because you don't have friends. Oh, y'all don't hear what I'm saying. Marriage is not a replacement for all other relationships. Oh, y'all don't hear what I'm saying. See, people get married and cut everybody off. And then the moment you and your other fall out, you ain't got nobody to call and nobody to talk to about. Y'all don't hear what I'm saying. I just need to hang out for a few minutes, get out the house, and I done cut everybody off because I've been booing hard for the last six months. But friendships are important. Family is important. As well as marriage, everything has its place. Yeah. Everything has its purpose. 
And we have to come to a place in our walks with God where we find some balance. Church people are the most imbalanced people anywhere. It's either all of this and none of that or all of this and none of that. Come on, somebody. And we have to learn how to live balanced lives because it's the balance of life that creates wholeness and fulfillment. It's the balance of, come on, y'all. It's the balance of life. You can't be walking around mad all the time. That ain't healthy. You got to be able to laugh sometimes. You got to be able to have a little joy. It's okay to be a little sad every day. The balance of life, everything in its place, everything in its season, everything fulfilling its purpose. That's right. That's right. There are also ungodly soul ties. Now, understand that some of these very relationships that can be godly can be ungodly. You with me? What makes an ungodly soul tie depends on the nature of the bond and how it was formed. I'm going to say that again. What makes an ungodly soul tie depends on the nature of the bond and how it was formed. I hope y'all let me teach today. I really do. Because I feel like teaching. Because God wants to set somebody free up in this place. Do you hear what I'm saying? If you're wondering what this message is about, if your soul is cluttered and entangled and embittered with all kinds of gook and junk and stuff, from relationships and friendships and betrayals. God wants you to be free. (sighs) My God. My God. It depends on the nature of the bond and how it was formed. A few ways unhealthy soul ties can be formed are as follows. Are you ready? For those that are taking notes. Abuse. Abusive relationships can form soul ties. It is not just good relationships or good loving that form soul ties. Remember, the soulish realm is your mind, your will, your emotions. Abusiveness is designed at penetrating your defenses and gaining some level of control in your head. That's right. That's right. In your mind. When an abuser, uh, let's say for instance, uh, snatches a child and takes that child out of their environment, the first thing that they do is try to instill fear in that child. They play on the child's emotions and say, don't you say nothing. If you say something, then I'm gonna, your mom is going to be mad at you. Your dad is going to hate you. Y'all don't hear what I'm saying. They are playing on the emotions, creating an unhealthy soul tie, a connection to that child through abuse. Physical abuse, sexual abuse, emotional abuse, Verbal abuse is all gateways that soul ties can be established. Adulterous affairs. That's another way that a soul tie can be established. In adulterous affairs... There is emotional connection. Many times there is sexual connection with someone that is in covenant with somebody else. Understand that you can be married and create a soul tie with someone else in an affair situation. 
You see what I'm saying? A bond. Let's go back to the definition. A connection. A leak. A longing. A pulling that pulls you continually into this person's gravitational pull. Though you know it's wrong. Though you know they're not yours. Sex before marriage. This is another one. That's slightly different than an affair, an adulterous affair, because you can be, there can be two single people that's not in a relationship with anyone else. But sex before marriage creates soul ties. It causes you to illegally form a bond that was designed and designated for the marriage relationship. Y'all don't hear what I'm saying? How many people are you, have you become one with? Hallelujah. How many people have you become one flesh with? How many people have you given a little piece of your soul over here? A little piece of your soul over there. A little piece of your soul down the street. A little piece. See, soul ties breed internal turmoil. Internal confusion. Y'all don't hear what I'm saying. Instability. Because there's a little piece of you everywhere. There's a million man march in your soul. Or a million woman march. Because soul ties are not just about women. Men can establish soul ties also. Come on. See, the women been getting it hard, getting beat up here the last two weekends because there's been a lot of women ministering, so they're kind of focusing where their comfort zone is. But brothers, we're not exempt. And you being married doesn't mean you're exempt, and it doesn't mean it can't happen to you if you don't guard your soul. Hallelujah. See, that's what we do. We take our guards down. We get married, we take our guards down. We don't think that applies to that. I got a wife. Blah, blah, blah. I'm safe. Wrong. The devil don't quit because you married. All right. All right. He don't care nothing about you being married. He don't care nothing about you being a preacher. He don't care nothing about none of that. Right. So sex before marriage, that's a gateway to forming an unhealthy soul time. I wonder we can't get away from people. And some of some some people have a circuit. No, no, I'm serious. So when this ain't going good, well, there's another tie. So I'm pulled that way. And then when that ain't going good, that's all right, because there's another tie. There's another bond I have. I have a connection with all of these people. Y'all don't hear what I'm saying. It can be formed through obsessive entanglements with a person. Now these are friendships gone awry. This person is a friend, but you've given them more authority in your life than you give to God. A friend that wants to control you, control where you go, control who else you can be friends with. Y'all don't hear what I'm saying. I'm talking about soul ties. They feel like you can only hang out with them and you can only talk to them and you can only. And they seek to control you and circumvent the process of God that they have more pull in your life. A friend that can pull you to do things that are outside of the will of God. That's a soul tie. So what? Your friend drinks. So what? Your friend want to go to the club. Who do you serve? Who do you serve? Do you serve God? 
or do you serve your friend? Oh, God. Help us to examine ourselves. Controlling relationships. That could be a boss controlling you. That could be anybody controlling you. Controlling, a, a leader controlling you. Controlling relationships. That's a soul tie. And it's unhealthy. Now, let's go just, let's go just a step deeper. Vows, commitments, and agreements can be unhealthy soul ties. Vows, B-O-W-S, commitments, and agreements. Vows are known to bind the soul. Numbers 30 and 2. Marriage itself consists of vows and binds the two people together. Ephesians 5 and 31, therefore, I have little reason to overlook the concept of vows and commitments as being a means to create a soul tie. If for instance, I'll never love anyone the way I love you. And you ain't married. And you're in a sinful, ungodly relationship. And you're making a vow to this person. Yeah. 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 That creates an ungodly soul tie. Y'all hear what I'm saying? Yeah. How many of us have made vows to people? All right. Come on. Yeah. Hmm. And we wonder why we can't move forward. We wonder why we don't have the ability to give love to the right person when the right person comes because we've given all of that away. How you can be with someone in a relationship but be thinking about somebody else. Somebody you used to. And we carry a lot of this stuff into salvation. Understand that when you get saved, it's your spirit that gets saved. Y'all not talking to me. It's your spirit that gets saved. All the entanglements of your soul are not automatically broken at the cross. Not automatically. Your spirit is saved, but your soul has to be saved. It has to be renewed. Be not conformed to this world, but be ye transformed by the renewing of your mind. That's the soulish realm. Then, no wonder you can't operate and step into the perfect will of God for your life. Because until that old thinking, until those old ties, those vows and those commitments that you've made that were ungodly are broken, then will you be able to prove what is that good and perfect and acceptable will of God. Now let's look at our text. Like I said, we've been beating the women up, so I didn't go grab the woman at the well. Come on, woman at the well. You had all kinds of men in your life. And the one you was with when Jesus met you wasn't your husband either. (laughs) So I didn't want to grab her. Did some people want to grab Mary Magdalene? But but really, Mary Magdalene wasn't, she wasn't a hoe. The Bible didn't say that. The Bible says she had seven devils. Read your Bible. Don't let preachers get up here and tell you stuff about people that the Bible didn't say about them. Uh, I mean, if you want to presuppose that one of them devils was a whoremongering devil, okay. <laughs> but really, she just had seven devils. That's what the scriptures said. It didn't say we made her a prostitute. We done made her all kinds of stuff. A woman of ill repute. 
Mary Magdalene was a hoe, and she met Jesus, and uh, so I didn't pull on Mary Magdalene. She didn't fit anyway. Now, I pulled on a man, Solomon. What's disturbing, here's what's most disturbing to me about this, this passage of scriptures. is Solomon was like the wisest king, like he was the man. You know, he made all of these sacrifices unto the Lord. You know, he, got, he knew, he learned enough from his daddy to know how to get God's attention. Oh, y'all don't hear what I'm saying. David knew how to get God's attention. David was like, David could spit some game like, against thee and against thee only have I sinned and, and purged me with hyssop and what? David would talk some stuff like, God, you coming down here. You coming to help me. I did it. It was me. Like, don't punish the kingdom, God. Get me. It's me. I, come on. He knew. He knew. He knew. David knew. David was. David knew how to talk to God. So Solomon, if he learned anything from his daddy, he learned how to get God's attention. And he certainly got God's attention through his many sacrifices that went up before the Lord. Man, when is the last time you worshiped till God came down? What do you want? <laughs> no, really. Because you, you're getting it in down here. What do, you know God, but what do you want? When is the last time you laid on your face till you got God's attention? Right? But some of us don't last that long. We give up. You're like, I guess he ain't coming. I'm going to eat. <laughs> he ain't said nothing. I'm just, well, Lord, we'll try again tomorrow. No. <laughs> Solomon did not stop sacrificing it to the Lord. And the Lord came like, boy, you must, what, what do you must want something. What do you want from me? What I got to do to bless your life? <laughs> and Solomon flipped the script. He didn't ask to be rich because some of us would ask to be rich. If the Lord came down like a genie in a bottle, you'd be like, give me some money, Jesus. I'll take a man, Jesus. Big house, oh God. I mean, you know what I'm saying? It's like, like really? Like if God came and asked you whatever, ask me for whatever you want. How many of us would say, I, I, I just want to know you? How many, like really, seriously? That might be like sixth or seventh down on the list. Oh, and by the way, I'd like to know you a little better. <laughs> Solomon said, I want wisdom to judge your people righteously. Like, really, Solomon? You're spitting like your dad. That's how your dad talked to God. <laughs> and God said, because you have asked for this right thing, this good thing, yeah. I'm going to give you all that other stuff, too. All right. So not only was he, he the most wise man, he was the richest man. Yeah. I mean, his kingdom, his the palace, some of the, 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 the sights, and sounds of the halls and courts of Solomon was, you know, the hanging garden, just, you know, the, the, the things that this man had, it was mind-blowing. He was wise beyond belief. Hmm. What could you do with just a little more wisdom? All right, all right, all right. Oh, y'all don't hear what I'm saying. You don't need no money. You need some wisdom. Amen. Come on. You don't need a new car. You need some wisdom. Because if you got some wisdom, some of the mess you in, you could get it figured out. 
Come on. God ain't got to bail you out if you quit making dumb decisions. I'm serious now. Like, we just, we dig holes and like, oh, God, I'm in another hole. Yes, you dug it. Wisdom. Wisdom. This man had the very wisdom of God rest on his administration. Yet, Solomon had a woman problem. I mean, that's more than a, a woman for every day of the month. And, I mean, th- this is this is like insatiable. You know, it's like really Solomon. Like, is that serious? Like, I don't know what kind of prehistoric Viagra that they was using back then. But he needed some help. You need something now. I mean, you came every day, two, three times. I don't know how you do this without some help. Right? Solomon had a woman problem. How can you be so wise and be so stupid? How can you be so wise in ruling God's people but lose sight of obeying the very God that you petition for wisdom? God said, don't intermarry. Don't mess with these foreign women. Oh, God. Come on, church. Well, why, is it, why, why can't I date an unbeliever? Why can't you date an unbeliever? Because God said so. Because God knows the consequences. We got to stop re- start realizing that we do not know better than God. You ain't got to like it, but understand that if you obey God, God is saving you from something. Yeah, thank you, Jesus. Mm. My God. It may be painful, but the safest place in the whole wide world is in the will of God. It's the safest place. God said, do not intermarry. Don't let them intermarry with you. Here's why. God even told him why. Because they will turn your heart away from me to their gods. See, a person who you create a soul tie has a power with you. That nobody else has. My God. A person you have a soul tie with will continually put you in compromising situations. A person that you have a soul tie with will make you go against your better judgment. Y'all don't hear what I'm saying. A, a, a person that you have a soul tie with has a pool in your soul and on your mind and on your heart that nobody else can pull it like this. And if you are bound to, and see, this is why we got to be bound to believers, because the idea is, yeah. is that if we are bound to a believer, we're pulling each other into God. Yeah. Come on. We're pulling each other into obedience. We're pulling each other into prayer. Y'all don't hear what I'm saying? We're pulling each other. Yeah. Hmm. I'm encouraged. No, we can't do that. I got to go home. Come on. Y'all don't hear what I'm saying? Uh, but but when you start messing and intermarrying with those who God has forbidden, God understands you are not strong enough. God, y'all don't hear. You think you're strong. I told you, some of the most dangerous words that you can say is, I can handle it. All right. 
That's been the downfall of a many a man and a many a woman. I can handle it. I'm okay. It's all right. I know what I'm doing. Y'all don't hear what I'm saying. But you don't know what you're doing. You got to understand that the heart is deceitful. It's desperately wicked. And God knows this. Who can know it? God knows it. God knows the games that the heart plays. <laughs> God knows the cinema of the heart. Oh, y'all don't hear what I'm saying. God knows how the heart has the ability to bend the truth. Uh, God knows. God, help me, help me. God said you got to be careful who you bond with. You got to be careful who you give your heart to. Solomon, don't mess with them women. Because they will turn your heart from me. Let me say this. If you want to meet a weak Christian, I will introduce you to a Christian who has all unsaved friends. <laughs> Y'all don't hear what I'm saying. You don't hear what I'm saying. If you want to meet a weak Christian, I will introduce you to a Christian who has not been able to let go of their worldly entanglements. They try to come into the kingdom, but the friends pull them back. Because I love them after, come on, bond. Soul time. You don't hear what I'm saying. But I love my friends. And I went to high school with them. And, and we grew up all of our lives. And, and God wouldn't expect me to give up what I love. Solomon! Don't marry those women. They're going to turn your heart from me, y'all don't, y'all don't hear what I'm saying. Oh God, help me. God knows what He's talking about. God knows what He's talking about because He understands that the right soul tie can wreck your marriage. That girlfriend you never detoxed out your system comes to town. Oh, that's my friend. Can we meet for lunch? No. 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 Because when I was with you, we was in sin. Y'all don't hear what I'm saying. I don't know where you are. I don't. Or if we go to lunch, sure, me and my wife. Yeah, come on now. Soul ties. You think it's all cool, but you know in the back of your mind. Mm, one more time, nobody would know. Mm, Y'all don't hear what I'm saying. I'm talking about married men. Nobody would know. Nobody would. Well, she's leaving town in a few days. It's a soul tie that needs to be severed. It needs to be dealt with. Solomon, don't mess with. See, 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 marriage, marriage, you go into the marriage, you go into a marriage, and then you have comparison. Mm -hmm, yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. See, that's what soul ties create. It creates contrast, contradiction, yeah. comparison yeah. between you and the person that you're in now in a holy covenant with. The soul has to be renewed to even have a successful marriage. Y'all right. 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 don't hear what I'm saying. I said the soul has to be renewed. Don't think just running off and getting married breaks soul ties. Right. 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 All you're doing is adding your wife to the list. Yeah. 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 My God. My God. Oh, my God. Oh. I told you married people this is for everybody oh understand that you can not only be tied to a person you can be tied to a thing yeah. somebody hit your car 
and your life ends. No, it's, a, it's, it's, it's an unhealthy attachment. It's a car. It can be fixed. You can get another one. Come on. Your day is ruined. Your month is ruined. You're mad at everybody because your car got a scratch on it now. Won't let nobody drive your bucket. Keep your bucket. It's a soul tie. You can also be tied to experiences. Uh, things that have happened to you in your past yeah, that you try to forge forward in your future but you can't forge into your future because your past is holding on to you. So you go into a new situation with an old mindset. Right. Mm. You go to a new church with the old church's problem. Y'all don't hear what I'm saying. You feel about the new pastor the way you felt about the old pastor because that soul tie has not been broken. You didn't do it, but in my mind, you, you have. In my mind, you just like Jim. Oh, come on. Come on. Come on. See, people don't realize the complexities of the soul and of the heart and of the mind that we're wrestling with that's inhibiting us in our current situations. Why is a soul detox necessary? Why? It's necessary because it prevents you from serving God totally and obediently. You cannot serve God completely when you have other entanglements, particularly those that are unhealthy and ungodly. It's necessary because when there is pollution of the soul, it prevents you from moving forward to enjoy healthy relationships. Pollution. Pollution of the soul. So many Christians' souls are polluted. That's why we can't. That's why we come in here and we can't get along. Right. It's pollution. It's called toxins. And it's surging through our heart and surging through our minds. Behind our praise the Lord. Um, God bless you. Uh, blessed and highly favored. And um, who she thinks she is. Don't nobody like her anyway. She thinks she ain't. That's what we do. Oh, brother, that was a great word. God bless you, but I can preach better than you. I mean, it wasn't. I'm talking about the soul. I'm talking about the soul. I'm talking about the soul. Come on. It's, it's toxicness in our soul that God wants to cleanse. It causes you to live an embittered life. Who wants to sit in the house of God and be bitter? Mad at the world. Mad at the job. Mad at my family. Mad, 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 mad. That's an indication that your soul is tied to some things that you need to let God cut. Hmm. Can't move forward. Can't form new bonds. Can't connect to nobody new because of the old connections. Ultimately, it causes you to live a restricted life. Yes. Soul ties restrict your mobility. It's like a leash. A leash is designed to set parameters for your dog. So somebody will walk past the yard, the dog will take out. That's what a soul tie is. Every time you try to move forward, every time you meet a new friend, every time you go into a new situation, because you're carrying what the last people did. The last church rejected me. Oh, come on. I'm talking about soul ties. 
the last church rejected me. They didn't receive my ministry. So I come into the place and I want to commit myself and I want to get in the earth. I want to love you. My God. I want to be with you. I want to come. Ah! Soul ties. How do we get free? I'm glad you asked me that. How do we get free? Because that's the million dollar question. Okay, we know we, we jacked up. We know, we know that there are issues. We know that there are things that God wants to do in our soul. But how do I get free? Number one, y'all ready? If any sins were committed to cause this soul tie, repent of them. We talked about fornication. That's... That's a common way to create a nasty soul tie. Mm -hmm. That's why people is get get their heads beat in and keep going back. That's why people, you know, he cheats on you and, and she keeps going back. And you, you, to, to you, it doesn't make sense like any sensible person. But when there's a soul tie, yeah. what makes sense isn't sense anymore. Right. 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 Because I'm being driven by the bond. I'm being driven by the emotional thing. Mm -hmm. The emotional pull. I'm not being driven by logic and reason and sense. Which is, leave him alone or you're going to get HIV. Eventually, he's going to bring something home to you. Eventually, he's going to kill you. Y'all hear what I'm saying? Amen. It keeps you going back to toxic relationships. And if for no other reason, maybe he ain't beating you. Maybe he's not cheating on you. But the relationship continually draws you into disobedience. It's toxic. It's that simple. Number two, if gifts were given to you by the other person in connection with the sin or the unholy relationship, such as rings, flowers, cards, uh, underwear, etc., get rid of them. Such things symbolize the ungodly relationship and can hold a soul tie in place. You know, when the right song goes on and you go and just want to look at the stuff. Y'all ain't together. Come on. I want to look at the card and just sit there and cry. <laughs> Any rash vows or commitments made that played a part in forming the soul tie should be renounced. Yeah. Yeah. See, we're in a speaking kingdom. Yeah. Yeah. Words, your, the, 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 your tongue produces life or it produces death. Yeah. So you cannot play down the necessity for calling out the issue and renouncing that out of your mouth. Because everything you created, you created it with your mouth. Yes. So we're going to create some new things. Amen? Amen? Things like I will love you forever. I could never love another man or another woman. Need to be renounced. Particularly, again, those commitments that were spoken verbally in sin. Okay? That's what we're talking about specifically. The ungodly soul tie. Proverbs 21, 23 says, Whoso keepeth his mouth and his tongue keepeth his soul from troubles. The tongue has the ability to bring soul, the soul great troubles and bondage. Ensnared by your own mouth. 
I can't live without you. Really? I can't live without him. So all of a sudden, when the relationship goes sour, thoughts of suicide come. Mm. I'm in the house. I can't live without you. You spoke a vow. And you opened up the door for the enemy to come in. Here's the next thing. Forgive. Forgive that person if you have anything against them. Unforgiveness enables soul ties. If I'm still angry with people and I haven't let people go of their offenses to me, it keeps me tied to them. They've gone on. Some of them have died. But I'm still tied to what they did to me. I'm still hurt by what they did to me. I still function because of what they did to me. I live a certain kind of way. Y'all don't hear what I'm saying. I think and I approach things a certain kind of way because of what they did. But forgiveness does not free them. It frees you. You got to let it go. Touch three people and tell them, let it go today. Let it go today. Let it go today. Renounce the soul tie. Do this verbally in Jesus' name. You can say something like, I renounce and any ungodly soul ties formed between myself and as a result of in Jesus name I renounce it I reject it I disallow it y'all don't hear what I'm saying and lastly break the soul tie in Jesus name do it verbally you have authority in the name of Jesus you have authority as a child of God To break soul ties. You break it and you call it out. We are notorious for wanting to be general in church. So what do you need prayer for? Well, I just, you know, pray for my strength in the Lord. No! No. You came to this altar for a reason. What is it? Call it out. Identify it. Call its name. Y'all don't hear what I'm saying. The devil hides in secrecy. His greatest ally in this world today is he doesn't exist. That's his greatest ally. Whatever you cannot confront, you cannot conquer. Whatever you cannot confess, you cannot be healed from. If it still hurts, it still hurts. If you are still hurting because he or she left you, don't get up here and talk in faith as if it doesn't exist. Faith is being able to admit it and release it and invite God into the situation. That's faith. If we want to be whole, if we want to be clean on the inside, we got to start with being transparent before the Lord. We got to start with being honest. Church teaches you to front. Church teaches you to fake it. Why? Because we want to be accepted. We want to be viewed in a positive light. Honey, you ain't got to view me in a positive light as long as I'm free. 
You don't have to view me in a positive light as long as I don't have to keep walking around carrying this stuff. You want to talk? Go ahead and talk. You don't think I'm called? Oh, well. You didn't call me no way. This is how we have to get serious about our growth in God. We got to get serious about it. Trust and believe. I don't care what it looks like. It's dressed up. It's got suits and nice ties and everything on. Everything in here got something God is working on. Yes. Everybody in here. Yes. He's going to be working on us until we leave up off this planet. You are not in your glorified body. You are, come on. We've got temptations, and we've got troubles, and we've got challenges, and we will have them until Jesus. He gave us a helper because we need some help. What you need the Holy Ghost for if you don't need no help? Oh, for power. Power is the last thing you need to worry about right now. You need to worry about some help. Power is a secondary consequence. We focus on the power of the Holy Ghost and the gifts of the Holy Ghost, but we don't focus on the help of the Holy Ghost, inviting him into our weaknesses. Inviting him into our infirmities. Inviting him into our struggles. My God. Today, I want us to take off masks. I want us to take off pretense. I want us to take off titles. And I want us to get real with God. The soul is important to your ability to successfully serve him. It's important. God wants your soul unencumbered. He wants you to be able to go on and love right and live right and move on with your life. To come out of the past, to come out of the tomb, of the things that you've been through. There was a man, he was possessed with a devil. I'm closing. And he was cutting himself, throwing himself into the fire. And the Bible says that Jesus came and Jesus spoke to his situation. Here's the beautiful thing. That after this, the Bible says the man was clothed and in his right mind. When Jesus comes, he doesn't come just to do a part way work. He doesn't come to fix up your spirit and buy you some church clothes. He comes to deal with our minds. He comes to deal with our hearts. He comes to deal with the things that make up who we are. God wants to detox somebody's soul today. Everybody stand.